Hello, I'm Daniel Benjamin, and I am the president of the American Academy in Berlin, and I'm delighted to welcome you to our presentation of the Spring 2021 Fellows. In a moment, I'll turn the proceedings over to Justice Susanna Baer of Germany's Constitutional Court, and she will deliver this year's address to the Fellows. First, though, I want to thank Nina von Maltzahn, our longtime trustee, supporter, and sponsor of this event. I also want to thank the Kellen Arnold family and uh, all of our other trustees uh, and many donors for the tremendous support that they have given us, which has made the work of the Academy possible. This is my second fellow's presentation, and I should add the second presentation that has taken place during the coronavirus pandemic, which has claimed so many lives worldwide and shut down normal business almost everywhere. Ordinarily, the presentation of the fellows is a high point on our calendar, and uh, it involves a festive and even glittering evening here at the Academy's Hans Arnold Center. Of course, that remains impossible, and so we are coming to you again by Zoom over the internet. Well, while that is all very regrettable, uh, we have a lot to be grateful for here at the Academy. The vaccine rollout has begun, and while it may not be taking place at lightning speed, the end of the pandemic, we hope, is in sight. We have a, uh, we've been in a pretty comprehensive lockdown here in Berlin since November, but we can look forward now to resuming in-person events sometime in the coming months. There are good grounds for optimism. Last fall, only three of the usual cohort of 10 to 12 fellows made it to the Academy. The rest participated in Academy events by internet connection. And frankly, I'm quite pleased that we've had the technological advances that have made that possible because in another era, it would have been uh, difficult and even impossible to involve our fellows, our far-flung fellows, in the life of the Academy. But we did that, and uh, we are hoping that uh, those who could not join us here in Berlin uh, last term will still do so at some point in the not-too-distant future. Uh, this term, we're doing better. Already, five fellows have arrived at the Academy, and we expect a pretty full house later in the term. We do still need to observe social distancing requirements, which makes the kind of personal interchange between fellows and guests uh, extremely difficult. And in addition, our programming, including the events with fellows, will of course have to continue to be virtual. Uh, obviously, this is not ideal, but thanks to the resolve and the ingenuity of the Academy's really outstanding staff, uh, which has stretched itself to adapt to these very challenging circumstances, we will still have first-class intellectual fare to present. I'm hopeful for the future, both here at the Academy and more broadly. We have an extraordinary array of scholars and artists here this term, and they are arriving against a backdrop of a much improved uh, transatlantic relationship. There is a positive change in the air, and I'm confident that despite the COVID-related constraints uh, that we all face, they will be able to do their part to help the Academy fulfill its mission of bringing the ideas and the expression of some of America's foremost thinkers and creators to the attention of the German public. Now I'd like to introduce our speaker for this event. Justice Susanna Baer is one of Germany's most distinguished jurists. She's been a member of the Constitutional Court in Karlsruhe since 2011, and she is renowned for her scholarly work on law and gender studies. She has taught widely, but above all, at Berlin's Humboldt University. She knows the United States very, very well, having received her master's in law uh, from the University of Michigan, which uh, is something that it seems uh, many <laughs> of Germany's foremost legal minds have done. She also taught at Ann Arbor for uh, a number of years, and she received there one of her several honorary doctorates. I'm delighted she could speak to this year's fellows, and I want to thank her for doing so, and I look forward to the day that we can welcome her here at the Academy. Justice Baer, the virtual podium is yours. Welcome. 
Welcome, dear fellows of this year's class at the American Academy. My name is Susanne Beer, and I'm a justice at the Federal Constitutional Court of this country. I'm also a professor at Humboldt University for Public Law and Gender Studies. Um, and I have the pleasure to welcome you here at the American Academy, and I hope this is a special day for you. It is a special day for the Academy, for me, for the community around it and around you, for the city of Berlin, in fact, for the country, and I think for what I would call transatlantic spirits. It's a spirit that moves the Academy, but that also is created at the Academy to move things for the better. And I think this is what the American Academy is all about. So again, I hope this is a special day for you. What day is today? It's the birthday of Marie Stritt in 1855, a fighter for women's rights in Germany. It's the birthday of Hedwig Kurz Mahler in 1867, an author. It's a birthday of Toni Morrison in 1931, a, a poet and uh, thinker you might all know. It's the birthday of Yoko Ono, of Randy Crawford, or if you go for that one, John Travolta. It's the birthday of Amin Laschet, one of the right now prominent German politicians, the birthday of many people. But what seems closer to my heart as a justice, a legal scholar, a critical law and society person, a researcher, a feminist gender scholar, and a fan of the American Academy and transatlantic spirits that move things is that the 12th of February, a few days ago, is the birthday of the NAACP, the movement, the civil rights organization to move things, to move people, things, thoughts, practice, and it has a Berlin connection, just as we all hope you develop one in right now and in the future. The connection is W.E.B. Du Bois, William Edward Burkhardt Du Bois. He studied in Berlin in 1892 to 94, he lived in the Oranienburger Straße 130. You might visit the place. There's a placard there. And he published in German, invited by eminent sociologist Max Weber in 1906. To me, he is a figure that suits the day and your stay in Berlin, a transatlantic spirit, a mover, a curious mind. And I quote, he said, I found myself on the outside of the American world looking in and it revealed things to him he had not seen before. He was also, as you all know, a courageous intervener. And this is also why I'm happy to uh, invoke his thoughts today because he founded The Crisis. The Crisis, a journal to, I quote again, set forth those facts and arrangements which show the danger of race prejudice. An eminent call today and one of the very things the American Academy is known for to engage with. This is why he connects us, you, the city, Berlin, America, today. It suits our times, it's passt zu unserer Zeit, because yes, many people have the feeling and the experience to live in a crisis, so we have reasons to move. In addition, prejudice is a call of the day we have to fight and in 2021, we are proud to have you to join the communities in that fight. Again, W.E.B. Du Bois might be one of the very persons you meet in this city, one of many minds to explore, to revisit and to create what I would call a transatlantic spirit. Enjoy your time here. We will enjoy your presence and move things. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Robert Reedfarm. I'm a professor of studies of women, gender, and sexuality and African and African American studies at Harvard University. And I'm proud to be the Anna Marie Kellen Fellow at the American Academy for the spring of 2021. My project, James Baldwin, The Making of an American Icon, builds on the work of generations of Baldwin scholars, including Baldwin biographers by asking how and why Baldwin was able to achieve such remarkable and lasting celebrity status. In six novels, six collections of essays, two stage plays, a collection of short stories, a collection of poetry, a screenplay, a coffee table book with Richard Avedon, a children's book with Joran Kazak, a collection of letters with Saul Stein and countless speeches, interviews, reviews, and other occasional pieces, Baldwin shocked and amazed his publics 
with not only the skill and dexterity with which he wielded his pin, but also his insight and his daring. At the same time, one must ask how an African-American queer author, one often derided during his lifetime as ugly, hysterical, effeminate, and bombastic, could become one of the most prominent intellectuals of his generation. Baldwin writes of the matter, quote, a celebrated artist is, so far as the public is concerned, a vulnerable, possibly valuable, fallen or abandoned object on a lonely beach. The public are as relentless as the waves of the sea and is patient, and their intention quite helplessly and without conscious malice is to submerge this creature, to bring him to death by drowning in that sea, his legend, which he has himself quite helplessly created." End quote. Part of what excites me about this project is that it draws heavily on the remarkable collection of materials housed in the James Baldwin papers of the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture of the New York Public Library. That remarkable collection came open in 2017 and offers an amazing view onto the everyday realities of Baldwin's struggles both to break through as a young author and to negotiate the complexities of his remarkable life and career. In addition, my work is indebted to the major Baldwin collections at the Banneke and Houghton Libraries of Yale and Harvard, respectively. During my time as a fellow of the American Academy, I will continue to work on a draft of James Baldwin, The Making of an American Icon, focusing primarily on the years between 1948 and 1957, the time of Baldwin's nearly decade-long residence in France. Finally, I'd like to say how happy I am to have this opportunity to reconnect with friends and colleagues in Berlin. I was a research fellow of the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation, and that led to research states at both Humboldt and the Freie Universität. I continue to have a particularly close relationship with the John F. Kennedy Institute at the FU. And perhaps more to the point, open or closed, I love Berlin and its people, and I very much look forward to the coming months. Thank you very, very much. I am Natalie Potes, Associate Professor in the Program of Arab Crossroads Studies at New York University in Abu Dhabi. I'm so grateful to the American Academy in Berlin for their extraordinary efforts to host and support us during this challenging year. As a cultural anthropologist, I've been conducting ethnographic fieldwork in Yemen and the Horn of Africa since the early 2000s. My recent book, Islands of Heritage, Conservation and Transformation in Yemen, analyzes the impact of environmental conservation, heritage, and development projects in pre-war Yemen by tracing their intersections in the Indian Ocean island of Socotra, which is one of the most biologically diverse places in the world. During my research for this project, I lived among rural pastoralists in a natural protected area where I was able to observe how Socotrans were coming to understand the environment and their place in the world through the lens of the World Heritage Regime. My book ended with an examination of how Sakutrans mobilized their heritage to advocate for cultural and political transformations during the Arab Spring. During my residency at the Academy, I will be working on a new book on Yemeni refugees and Ethiopian migrants in the Horn of Africa. The ongoing conflict in Yemen has resulted in what the UN has been calling the greatest humanitarian crisis in the world. Four million Yemenis, more than 10% of the country's population, have been internally displaced, and more than 350,000 individuals have sought refuge in the neighboring countries. I wanted to understand how and under what circumstances Yemenis were now seeking refuge in the Horn of Africa, even as migrants and refugees from the Horn continued to cross the Red Sea to reach the Arabian Peninsula. In fact, in the two years before the pandemic, the numbers of people migrating along this eastern route exceeded the numbers of persons crossing the Mediterranean from North Africa to Europe. For the past four years, I've been conducting ethnographic research in Obok, a small port town in northern Djibouti, the site of the world's only UN camp for refugees from Yemen. Located near the strategic Bab el Mendeb Strait, Obok is also the gateway for Ethiopians migrating to the Gulf states. My project, Gate of Tears, which is the English translation for Bab el Mendeb, examines the legal, political, and racialized distinctions made between refugees and migrants in this geopolitically sensitive 
increasingly militarized region. It explores how these refugees and migrants, both African and Arab, share trajectories, traverse categories, and disrupt or reinforce social hierarchies as they pursue a future through or within the confines of a fitful mobility. I look forward to spending these next few months writing and to thinking about this project from the perspective of migration to and within Europe in conversation with scholars in Berlin and my fellow fellows. I look forward to meeting you. Hello and thanks for joining us. I'm Nandini Pandey, an Associate Professor of Classics at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And I'm thrilled to be a Nina Maria Gorison Fellow in History this spring, working on a book about diversity and pluralism in ancient Rome. I'd like to thank President Benjamin and Justice Baer for their introductions, as well as all the Academy staff and donors who make this experience possible. I've never seen anything quite like the hospitality, support, and stimulation the Hans Arnold Center offers toward projects that hope to make a difference. It takes a community to make this happen. I'm honored to be part of it and grateful to have made it here to Berlin. The book I'm working on here hopes to intervene in contemporary debates about race and ethnicity in classical antiquity, but also classics use in constructing the West and whiteness, conversations that continue to affect us on both sides of the Atlantic. Greece and Rome have often been held up as exemplars of art, literature, law, and democracy, but also used to build Eurocentric systems of privilege, oppression, even ideas of culture and beauty. The whitening of classics is not only false to the multi-ethnic reality of the ancient Mediterranean, it's dangerous. White supremacist and anti-immigrant groups love to borrow classical images and authority, and there's public resistance even to historical truths, such as the fact that ancient statues were not white but brightly colored, or that there were Black people in Roman Britain. My book retells the story of Rome as one chapter in the history of diversity. It asks how the Romans managed their multi-ethnic state spanning parts of Europe, Asia, and Africa, and what we can learn from them today. Rome's empire was built on conquest and exploitation to be sure, but it also became an engine for racial and cultural mixing on a scale never before seen. And Rome exercised social, cultural, and legal mechanisms for inclusion and opportunity regardless of race. Its foundation stories feature immigrants, refugees, and asylum seekers. It detached citizenship from notions of blood and soil, giving it even to former slaves. And it understood its ability to incorporate and enfranchise diverse people as key to its success. We see occasional conflicts and resentments develop to be sure, but also a profound admiration for the city and empire that included the whole world. On the other hand, when we look at how everyday Romans encountered their empire's diversity, the picture gets considerably darker. Many people knew the faraway corners of empire largely through exotic people and trade goods collected in civic and domestic spaces, circuses, forums, dining rooms, and gardens. In these places, they learned to enjoy, but also manipulate, commodify, and destroy human difference in ways that equally have lessons for our modern pluralistic societies. If you'd like to hear more, please join me for a lecture on February 23rd entitled Roman Diversity, Modern Lessons from an Ancient Empire. I'd be glad to see you there. You're welcome to check out my piece in the Berlin Journal and um, please reach out by email if you have any interest in meeting virtually. I'm delighted to be part of this community and so grateful for your time. Thank you. My name is Hakim Abdurazak. I'm an associate professor of French and Francophone studies at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities. I'm delighted to be at the American Academy in Berlin, and I wish to thank all the staff for their support and assistance. During my fellowship, I will be working on a book project entitled Burning the Sea, Clandestine Crossings in the Mediterranean Cemetery. I have been publishing on clandestine migrations across the Mediterranean for 13 years now, my first book, Eccentric Migrations, tackles this phenomenon that we have witnessed over the past few years, but that has in fact existed for much longer, as is evidenced by the release dates of literary and cultural productions that my first book examines, which range between the last decade of the past century and early years of the current millennium, namely before the refugee crisis took place. 
My work centers on attempted maritime crossings partly because I contend that in today's so-called globalized world, in which the Mediterranean is increasingly militarized, the sea is charged with different meanings and functions and leads to a different imaginary, a different sense of the notion of mobility, and different conceptions about borders, belonging, and boarding a boat. In other words, the Mediterranean is fathomed differently from one rim to another, and the experience of migrants and refugees connecting the two shores is replete with information and implications conveyed through language, beliefs, cultural idiosyncrasies, societal modus operandi, etc., which we scholars must take into account in order to better understand this global phenomenon born of crucial local and regional specificities. What are the symbolic reasons for crossing the sea? Does the Mediterranean, its location and its history provide a rationale for people to set off to sea in spite of the dangers that await them? How do the refugee crisis and the Arab Spring, which both led to capsizing and drownings, explain each other? These are some of the questions that I will ask. My new book project will focus on the central and eastern Mediterranean, but will continue to scrutinize the crossings of migrants and refugees from the western Mediterranean, who hail from several countries in Africa and the Middle East, precisely because, once again, I argue that clandestine migratory movements today and prior to the refugee crisis are one and the same phenomenon. The fact that major media outlets began to shed light on these tragedies in the mid-2000s does not mean that they started at that time. Addressing false assumptions plays a significant role in my project. So do misnomers, which I will address in order to help redress the wrongs perpetrated by misinformation. Part of the work that I will be doing in the American Academy will consist in interrogating various artistic genres that constitute alternative narratives and new types of languages that probe, destabilize, or respond to discourses and media treatments that fuel propaganda or are appropriated by a political agenda. Thus, I will turn my attention to novels, films, comics, documentaries, plays, political cartoons, fine art and installation art produced in German, Turkish, Italian, Spanish, Arabic, Berber, and French. In short, my project will deal with the politics, poetics, ethics, and aesthetics of unauthorized and criminalized migrations. In an attempt to approach them as subjects of their own personal stories rather than objects of hegemonic discourse, I propose that we take a close look at the terminology that migrants and refugees use to refer to themselves, their burning desire to reach Europe, and their lived experience of the crossing. Indeed, a full picture of the issue at hand is only possible if migrants and refugees are examined along with their own conceptions of the environments in which they have been confined and of the sea which they have been forced to face and fight. Finally, for several years now, I have painted the Mediterranean as a site of surveillance, a place of death and divide, a lab for testing geopolitical strategies. This artistic endeavor has been part of my reckoning about migrancy, refugeehood, death at sea, discrimination in terms of freedom to travel, and how vernaculars impact our visions of life and death around and across the deadly sea. While in Berlin, I will also create a series of images inspired by the tragedies in the Sea Cemetery or Cemetery. Hi everyone, my name is Anna Weber and I'm this year's Inga Marin Otto Fellow in Music Composition. First, thanks so much to all of the staff who've been working tirelessly to make this semester happen at the American Academy Berlin, despite the ongoing pandemic and resultant travel difficulties. I'm currently in my home in Western Massachusetts, but I should be in Berlin in a few days and I'm thrilled that this is still gonna happen. I'm a composer, a saxophonist, and a flutist. As a performer, I'm active in both improvised and composed music, mostly in music that is a part of the jazz world, broadly speaking. 
My musical home is the New York City avant-garde jazz scene, which is also where I was based until very recently. As a composer, my writing and my approach to technique and theory comes from my practice as an improviser, and is deeply related to how my instruments create sound and how they interact with other instruments. My work aims to find some common ground where complex notational systems overlap with improvisation in ways that feel natural despite whatever underlying compositional systems might exist, and to create music that connects with listeners on both an intellectual and visceral level. My work also explores what it means to notate my own improvisatory language, thereby creating a unification between my compositional language and my improvisational language. This stems from a long-held belief of mine that as a composer and improviser, I have the ability to create the most ideal structures for myself to improvise over, as both the composition and the improvisation are coming from the same mind. In Berlin, I'll be working on a couple of different things. First, I will be working on an hour-long piece for a large ensemble based in Trondheim that will be premiered, COVID willing, in April. Second, I'll be doing research into just intonation and other related tuning theories, specifically into the practical applications of these systems within the genre of music that I work. Some of you may be aware of the difference between equal temperament and just intonation, but in case you aren't, I'll give you a little primer. Basically, what we generally refer to as in tune in the 21st century is based on a system called equal temperament, which divides the octave into 12 equal parts. However, this tuning system is actually a huge compromise from the natural resonances of pitches, and was not even widely adopted until the 18th century. The one advantage of equal temperament is that you can play in all the keys on a keyboard instrument. You've probably heard of the Well-Tempered Clavier by Bach. This was a celebration of being able to play in all 12 keys on the keyboard at long last. However, the extreme disadvantage of equal temperament is that everything becomes a little bit out of tune, with this, we lose all sorts of nuance, color, and resonance. There's been a resurgence of interest in more natural tuning systems, or just intonation as it's called, within recent years in new classical music. However, at this point, it's pretty unexplored in the context of jazz or improvised music, and I'm very curious to see what paths this research takes me on. Thank you all for listening, and I hope to see at least some of you in person soon. Hello and uh, greetings from Charlottesville, Virginia. Eric Lindstrom here. Uh, I'm so delighted and honored to be the Axel Springer Fellow at the American Academy in Berlin this spring. Thanks, first of all, to the staff of the Academy who have been working so hard to make a real fellowship possible under very difficult circumstances. And thanks, of course, as well to the board, the selection committee, and the supporters of the Academy. What does it mean to live in a society engaged in seemingly endless war? How does knowledge of torture and other atrocities find its way into everyday life? And how do people find ways to accommodate or live with that knowledge? Uh, these are the questions I'm asking uh, in Berlin this spring. Uh, as part of my book project on the end of empire in mid 20th century Britain. I think many people tend to think of 1945 as a moment of peace for obvious reasons, and this has certainly long been the case in British history. But seen from another perspective, 1945 actually inaugurated a new era of conflict and uh, as I say it, it would have seemed in many ways as though this were an unending series of conflicts at the time, primarily, though not exclusively, uh, wars fought to preserve uh, an empire, which, as we now know, was a largely futile enterprise. Uh, wars in Palestine, in uh, Kenya, in Malaya, in Cyprus, and elsewhere. Uh, thanks to a wave of work that's been done in recent years, we now know that these were brutal conflicts, and they did involve the use of torture, collective punishments, detention camps, uh, and other uh, rather grim uh, tactics. So what interests me, I think, is the fact that, uh, unfortunately, these conflicts have all kinds of parallels with uh, the wars which are still fought today, by imperial or nominally post-imperial uh, powers, 
these were counterinsurgencies, or as they were sometimes called at the time, small wars or low-intensity wars uh, or even states of emergency or police actions. Uh, and that rhetoric of smallness, I think, was intended to distinguish these conflicts from those that came before, especially the Second World War, with its massive mobilization of manpower, both civilian and military. Of course, these wars were smaller by comparison, but the argument uh, I'm making is that nonetheless, uh, they had a real impact on British society. And so what I particularly am interested in doing is uh, to trace the informational networks which linked colonial conflict zones with metropolitan British society. Uh, what did soldiers write in the letters they sent home and in the memoirs and novels they published later? Uh, what did missionaries and aid workers uh, write home? Uh, what reports did they file uh, with their bosses back in London as they did work in the detention camps where many of the worst abuses of these conflicts took place? Uh, what did journalists write and broadcast? Uh, what did novelists and uh, TV writers and screenwriters and playwrights uh, convey to the public about the reality of these conflicts? I think contrary to an assumption which is still very much widespread in Britain uh, today, uh, torture and other forms of brutality uh, were not secret. Uh, and they did uh, become a kind of common knowledge. I think even the phrase open secret suggests a level of uh, repression, which is sort of unwarranted here. So I'm interested in asking those questions. How did people come to know? And then, of course, how did they find ways uh, not to act on that knowledge? And of course, this is a question which, again, cuts to the heart of uh, so many uh, dilemmas that we face uh, even today. So that's a very brief uh, overview of what I'm doing. I, I have to say, I, I can't imagine a better place than Berlin to do this kind of work because um, this is a project, among other things, about memory, about the politics of memory, about the importance of confronting uh, sort of national uh, burdens of, of guilt and responsibility in the past. Uh, and I think also, um, you know, certainly in the age of Brexit, there's a lot to be said for trying to understand British history as something that's not uh, completely separate from uh, the history of, of nationalism and, and militarism in other parts of the world. So uh, I'll leave it there, but let me say again, um, thank you, and I'm, I'm so looking forward to being in Berlin in the next few weeks uh, and to meeting all of you. Hello, everyone. I'm Nora Alter, and I'm very happy to be here today, albeit virtually. I hope I am able to make it over to Berlin soon in March and to be able to meet all of you in person. I'm very grateful to the American Academy for awarding me a fellowship this semester, and especially for their flexibility and hard work in trying to make this strange season be as productive as possible. I live in Philadelphia, where good things do happen, and teach in the Department of Film and Media Arts at Temple University. My background is in comparative literature and critical theory, and I began my career writing about international protest theater about the Vietnam War in an age dominated by mass media and especially television. From drama, I gradually shifted to film, where I first came across the work of a relatively obscure German filmmaker named Tarun Faroki, who had made several anti-Vietnam War films. Later, when researching a book on post-war West German nonfiction film, I came across Faroki's work again and wrote a chapter on him. Subsequently, in the years that followed, as I wrote on the essay film, our paths often crossed and we even co-taught a course together. When he died unexpectedly at the age of 70 in 2014, I was often sought out to explain his work or situate his practice. I realized then that there was no resource in any language to which to direct people. My project for the Academy, Harun Faroki, Forms of Intelligence, therefore seeks to correct this lacuna 
and to write a comprehensive overview of the late writer, filmmaker, and artist. Faroki was based in Berlin from the early 1960s until his death. In my book, I hope to provide a conceptual lens through which to understand Faroki's media production from his early films of the late 1960s, when he was in the inaugural class of the German Film and Television Academy, the day FFB, through his television work, primarily for WDR, Westdeutsche Rundfunk, of the 1970s and 1980s to his recent contemporary art installations at such megasites as Documenta, Venice Biennale, Guangzhou Biennale, MoMA, Guggenheim, Centre Pompidou, and many others. My aim is twofold. Not only do I hope to provide a coherence to Faroki's career, but to write a history of avant-garde and experimental filmmaker over the past half a century, as materials have shifted from celluloid to video, and finally digital. As exhibition platforms migrate from theaters to televisions, to galleries, and finally, the internet. Because he made work during all of these phases and for all of these media, Faroki constitutes an ideal candidate upon which to focus. What first drew me to write about Faroki was that he was an essay filmmaker a genre that I argue is of nonfiction film that lies somewhere between philosophy, art, and documentary. As I said, I was originally trained in comparative literature, and such films were the closest to the literary genre that I could find. However, in my research, I soon realized that Faroki was much more than just an essay filmmaking and that indeed his practice extended into areas of documentary and even feature films. Further, I learned that in addition to making well over 50 films, he was a prolific writer, and that his written texts were often complementary extensions to his audiovisual work. It is my hope, during my time at the Academy, to produce a text that will bring together the many lines that compose Harun Faroki. I look forward to discussions with other fellows at the Academy and learning about their work this spring and to meeting the whole team of the American Academy in person. Thank you. My name is Atlas Goff. I'm an assistant professor of history at the University of Chicago, and I am honored to be the Nina Maria Gorison Fellow in History at the American Academy of Berlin in the spring of 2021. It's an exceptional opportunity to be here in the middle of the pandemic crisis, and I want to thank the staff here in Berlin for creating such a welcoming and hospitable environment in these difficult times. I'm using my fellowship to complete a book manuscript, which is a history of the idea that the fine arts can create modern liberal society. The book focuses on German states in the beginning of the 19th century, where scholars and bureaucrats hoped that art, rather than revolution, could transform the social and political order and prepare individuals to become free and moral citizens. This period is well known for its intense energy in the field of aesthetics, education, and museums. It was an age of classicism, romanticism, idealism uh, that established many of the ideas about the value of culture to public life that are still in circulation today. My work takes a different approach to this familiar story about art's power by looking at what happens to art objects at the beginning of the 19th century, which was not only a period of cultural optimism, but also one of extraordinary conflict, violence, and upheaval. The premise of my book is that this history of art in public life is inextricable from the history of war, and that the language of cultural politics that we have inherited from this period contains and, and conceals uh, legacies of these conflicts. To that end, I wanted to share with you a quick story um, that circulated in journals in 1800 about Johann Heinrich Wilhelm Tischbein, who was the director of the Academy of Fine Arts in Naples when the French stormed the city in 1799 during Napoleon's Italian campaigns. 
The story took various forms, but it goes roughly like this. Tischbein is hunkered down in his apartment, trying to calm himself by fidgeting with a marble bust of a Greek poet he had on hand when a band of soldiers breaks in. They loot valuables from him and his servants. They shoot at his art collection. Uh, he claimed that some of them even mistook his past plaster cast collection for sugar sculptures and started munching on them. According to Tischbein and his correspondence, amid this, amidst this scene of harrowing chaos, a remarkable conversion unfolded. One of the soldiers caught sight of one of Tischbein's paintings and was stopped in his tracks, mesmerized by its beauty. The work in question was this one, depicting a scene from the Iliad where Hector admonishes Paris in the presence of Helen for shrinking from battle. The soldier calls his comrades over, the entire band of looters is overcome. Their faces change, they enter into conversation with each other over the painting's merits. Eventually they leave the apartment peacefully, stepping over the splintered doorway they had hacked to pieces on the way in, talking about art all the way. This story's circulation suggests its appeal to readers at the time, and I admit that I find it pretty thrilling too. And I think that's for two reasons. First, it's delightful. This is how a work of art is supposed to behave in war. Its beauty not only transcends the violence around it, it extinguishes that violence. It literally disarms those who would do it harm. We have here a kind of aesthetic education in miniature in which a work of art inspires the peaceful civilization of man, an idea in which German observers of political developments in revolutionary France placed particular hope. But secondly, it horrifies, because we know that this is absolutely not how things tend to work. Uh, by 1799, the French were at the end of three years of pillage on the Italian peninsula and in Egypt, in which they seized and destroyed valuable cultural property. Shortly after 1799, they would turn their sights on significant Central European collections, including in Prussia, Brunswick, and Tischbein's own home state of Hessen Castle. The era of war and revolution at the turn of the 19th century generated both possibilities for German cultural politics. On one hand, the faith in the power of art to transcend the violence of the contemporary moment, to reform humanity, to heal a, a fallen world. world. On the other hand, uh, it signaled the recognition that despite ample contemporary fantasies to the contrary, art was falling prey to the very violence it was supposed to transcend. It was being looted, hidden, desecrated, destroyed, resacralized, and shown to be utterly dependent on the contingencies of its environment. I am writing a book that proposes that a conflict between these two possibilities, between art's power and its vulnerability, defined the cultural politics of the beginning of the 19th century and manifested in its signature institution, the Public Museum of Art. I'll have more to say about museums and the relevance of this tension to contemporary cultural politics in my talk, which will be on April 15th, and I hope to see you there. I'm Allison Blakely. I'm a professor emeritus of European and comparative history at Boston University. At the Academy this spring, I have the honor of being the Gerhard Casper Fellow. My project is completion of an interpretive history of the African diaspora in modern Europe. My research on this subject has centered on the European countries with the largest black populations, that is France, and what is now the United Kingdom. While Germany and the European part of Russia have the largest populations overall, based on census data and other documentary evidence, up to now I've been estimating the black population in Germany to be only the fifth largest in Europe. This is due mainly to less extensive historical ties with Africa. However, I've always believed that I'm underestimating the black population in Germany. 
In contrast to my earlier visits to Germany, which have all been very short, I'm hoping my affiliation with the Academy will afford me opportunities for more contact with related German cultural organizations that might help me arrive at a more accurate estimate. And my formal lecture presentation at the Academy this spring will be on Black identity in Europe in general. My main goal under the fellowship as I complete writing the book is to update my understanding of the present status of people of Black African descent in European societies, including the prevalent attitudes toward them. I'm suspecting that there may have been important changes in that regard in the wake of the recent large waves of immigration from North Africa and Asia. I do hope that we will have opportunities to interact to the extent possible under the continuing public health emergency so that we can also learn from one another. Hello, my name is Nahma Sohrabi and I'm a fellow here at the American Academy in Berlin for spring 2021. Before I start, I would like to thank the American Academy, particularly its staff and administration, who not only made it possible for me to sit here and stare out at the beautiful and currently frozen Lake Lanzi, but who have gone above and beyond to ensure our physical and emotional well being in these trying times. One of the themes I've been thinking about in the past 10 months of the pandemic is the way my life and our lives have interacted with and experienced this vast global pandemic. How and even if, when the history of the singular global moment is written, will our individual and collective experiences be narrated within it? For example, would the awkwardness that I'm talking to you through a Zoom camera be part of the history of the pandemic? I think about this because for the past several years, I've been wondering about the place of the small and the intimate within the vastness that is a revolution specifically the Iranian Revolution of 1979. In late 1978, millions of people across Iran took to the streets demanding the removal of the monarch Mohammad Reza Pahlavi and the replacement of the Pahlavi monarchy with a new form of government. On February 11th, 1979, the revolution was declared victorious. We know what the Iranian Revolution looked like as there are numerous photographs, films, audio recordings, and written documents of both the protests and the prose of its leaders. Many of these images portray men and some women frozen mid-chant with fists raised whose faces dissipate as the picture expands and becomes a sea of people flooding the square or the tree-lined streets of Tehran. These iconic images represent the vastness of the event, its remove, its thereness, what is missing though from these portrayals and thus from our imaginary are the kitchen sink conversations, the stories, the emotions, and the information people exchange around their lives that impact them as much as, if not more than, the momentous events recorded by historians and scholars and journalists. The book that I'll be working on during my time at the Academy, The Intimate Lives of a Revolution, conjures these smaller, more intimate images in order to tell the story of this revolutionary generation. It tells the story of the 20-year-old veiled skeptic of Khomeini who almost broke up with her boyfriend over which of the many revolutionary groups they should hand over the weapons they had confiscated on February 11th. The young man who realized the revolution had succeeded only when he looked out from his hiding place inside a mosque that had been surrounded by tanks only to see the tanks slowly move away. And the guerrilla fighter who was killed by his comrades for breaking the unspoken rule that love was forbidden in a revolution. And this particular story is what I'll be talking about for my academy talk on February 25th. Revolutions are tsunami-like events that shake or destroy the foundations of a system and have reverberations globally and through time. Somewhat controversially, I would argue that the Iranian revolution was the last grand revolution of the 20th century. 
one would be hard pressed to find anyone who woke up on February 12th, 1979, shrugged her shoulders and said, nothing has changed. And one would also be hard pressed to identify a world historical revolution similar in scope and in longevity since the 1979 revolution in Iran. My book is therefore the story of the last generation of revolutionaries that were formed not only in a particular national moment, but even more importantly, in a unique global revolutionary moment, the 1960s and 70s, arguably its own age of revolutions. The revolution is now 42 years old and it's revolutionaries in their 60s, 70s, and 80s. I've been conducting interviews with them for the last six years in North America and Europe, where many of them reside, including here in Berlin, where they've actually set up a very fascinating and unique archive. During these interviews, and quite often, I think about my favorite line in the book, Secondhand Time. The line goes, what happens between two people at night vanishes from history without a trace. In this way, I think of my book as a crucial record of an ephemeral history that very soon will be impossible to access and to tell. Thank you. I especially appreciate the Academy staff who have been both welcoming and super informative as I try to navigate my way to Berlin in these challenging times. I make video, print, and other works with appropriated material, mostly text, as a critical response to Black life in America. I have a strong interest in sonic cultures. Experimental electronic and dance music have become especially important for my work and thinking, and this continues to the present. Soundtracks, often from unexpected musical genres, operate in my projects to provide complementary or antagonistic layers for the minimal visual and textual elements. I'm drawn to the idea that popular music especially its African diaspora forms, are not only aesthetic and entertaining, but serve as a mode of historiography and thought with serious political potentials and implications. I work in modules and fragments. Often installation forms are part of the trajectory of my work. Sometimes installations have been productive contexts from which individual works are later drawn. More often lately, clusters of existing short works are spatialized and juxtaposed into installations. I was invited to participate in the 10th Berlin Biennial from June to September 2018. My Berlin project was my most comprehensive solo installation in Europe up until then. It realized my dream of presenting my work in a casual environment. Um, with the help of curator Gabi Incombo, the work was sited in the dark basement of a former rail freight depot in Moabit that is currently used as a club space with a bar. The space is now part of ZKU, a multidisciplinary culture center. It was a wonderful context to show 11 video works and also explore collaborative programs, electronic club nights, and dance performances. Over the past several years, I've been slowly developing a research project that I will continue to pursue at the American Academy in Berlin. The project is called The Daily Practice of Representation, The Artist and the Studio. I've become intrigued by examining the ways that commercial art, the commercial art market, critical publications, scholarly production, and artist self-presentation layer together to produce particular conditions for cultural production and discourse, which only appear to be obvious, true, and inevitable. Other influences are art practices that examine the subjective and social effects of spaces on cultural production and a desire to reframe the artist's studio in the context of recent ideas about immaterial labor, obviously um, computer um, interventions, gentrification, urban lifestyles, and increasing social inequality. This approach was highlighted in my summer 2019 project for The Shed in New York called Before and After the Studio. My broad hypothesis is that during and after modernity, the artist is a signal figure negotiating contradictory and unstable connections between markets, 
ideas about labor and value, politics, architectural spaces, and cultural legacies. Specifically, I wish to underline an argument where the figure of the artist is never assumed or neutral, and the studio and gallery are always ideologically charged. Additionally, while in Berlin, I hope to initiate archival research linked to new projects that I plan to present, one at the House of World Cultures Berlin in spring 2022, and another for two cultural institutions in Munich in summer 2022. Thanks for your attention, and I very much look forward to our meetings in Berlin. Thank you.